Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, Monday, June 24th, 2024. Bill is trustee me. Uh, start the meeting off with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Oh. Number three, agenda review. Uh, you have. I have one change for agenda review. I'd like to add a 10A. Number 10 is specifically related to Operation Stone Garden funds. Uh, we have Chief Matt Sullivan here. The additional item will be to approve a purchase of $62,559.75 for five sets of night vision uh, via Stone Garden managed by Public Safety. So. We'll reiterate that motion when we get there. I just want to make sure it's a placeholder uh, under 10A, please. Yep. And that is coming in. We'll talk about it. Yes. Uh, any other agenda reviews? No, no. No. Adam? No, sir. I'm all good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Number four public comment. Any public comment? How many people are going to look? We have a couple of yeah. Okay. Moving on. <laughs> Number five, approve and accept minutes from Monday, June 10th, 2024. I move that they be approved. I second. Okay, we have a first and second. Uh, any further discussion? Yes. That's a lot of information that you put on there. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Fine job. Was, was that all a lot of cut and paste or what? Some of it was. <laughs> but it's more than I could do, so nice job. Thank you. Any other further discussion? Okay. Uh, we have two to, uh, to accept. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any, any nays? Motion carried. Uh, number six, approve and accept village warrants through Thursday, June 20th, 2024. Make a motion to approve and accept the warrants through Thursday, June 20th, 2024. And I'll second. Okay. Okay, we have a first and second. Any other further discussion? One question, uh, just a small explanation on a warrant number 61. I, I didn't quite understand it. Stand by, please. It's 61, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Oh, that is our um, purchase power that we paid a Bepi, and we have to do that as an ACH transfer from the bank because they don't accept checks anymore. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? Motion carried. Uh, number seven. Discussion with Liz Curry for potential sponsorship of the DDCDB grant for Abenaki headquarters. I said that. John, you want to come up and sit at the big table? Well, I'm going to let Liz do all the talking first, and then if I need to speak okay. again. All right. I'll go Liz to I think you can in. hear me from here, too. <laughs> I, can, I can hear you from anywhere. Sure, man. We go way back. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead, Liz. Uh, good evening, and thank you for um, bearing with me participating virtually. And uh, I guess we're going to let John off the left. Did not come up to the table. I can't see him anyway. So. <laughs> I can see you. Um, okay, great. Um, thank you. So my name is Liz Curry, and I'm a consultant for nonprofits and municipalities and a specialty in mobile home parks um, with helping to redevelop property, whether that's buildings, historic buildings, municipal buildings, and water and wastewater infrastructure in mobile home parks. My role is to assemble all of the grants and the financing um, while also coordinating architects, engineers, um, environmental assessments, 
um, NEPA review, the environmental reviews for federal regulations, managing other regulatory compliance, and then I we just um, kind of keep everybody moving forward to finish the project um, and work with the client to um, make sure bills are getting paid and the client's getting reimbursed from grant funding sources. So I'm kind of a uh, general list, but also um, very focused on making sure all the money is in the bank before we put a shovel in the ground um, and all the regulations are complied with. So that's what I've been up to with the Palm Bay and Mrs. Boy. Um, start, it started with um, their goal was to really have a more, um, a better space to accommodate all their programs. And we initially looked at actually renovating the back building on their property at 100 Grand Avenue in addition to upgrading the main building, but that proved to be too expensive. As you all probably know, construction costs have really escalated beyond what anyone has ever imagined and so when we got that estimate um everybody realized that would be happening at the expense of really taking care of a lot of deferred maintenance you know, in the main building particularly for the food shelf um which has kind of exploded since the pandemic sadly um the pressure from the food shelf is very high in terms of moving a lot of food around really needing walk-in cooler and freezer needing electrical upgrades to do that and really just looking at their entire um, building, we needed a, a significant, significant amount of capital improvements, new roof, structural reinforcement for roof, energy efficiency, and then a lot of upgrades for finishes, ABA, and um, the interior finishes. So the, the total renovation scope we're looking at is about 1.17 million, um, all included, that includes a lot of pre-development, um, costs that we've already incurred and we have the money for. Once we get into construction, um, the grants that are needed for that are almost um, completed with the exception of this one community development grant that we are asking you to consider uh, being the pass through for. Um, and I've spoken with Heidi about that. Um, it would be the, the last piece we need in order to fund the full project and the construction. Um, so right now, I think we're probably somewhere around um, $350,000, $400,000 for grant requests. Um, so that is what we're here tonight to ask you for your consideration. And I don't wanna, you know, just go on and on if people have questions before um, I share more information. Liz, a question for you. Um, so, what, I guess, what is it specifically that you're asking of the village? Sure. Um, so, the state Department of Housing and Community Affairs manages federal money from HUD. And in order to access that grant money, it, only municipalities can be the applicant. Mm -hmm. And so, the way that it works is that the municipality agrees to sponsor the application on behalf of the usually the nonprofit or if you had a business revolving loan fund like the town does you know then they pass it through to the FTP administering that so the town receives technically what happens is you all as the trustees pass a series of resolutions um hold a public hearing and then essentially agree on all these documents to be the applicant and agree that you will pass the money through to McClum Bay. <clears throat> so that is that is kind of the way it looks. There are some considerations that I believe your staff um, certainly raised with me. I don't I don't want to speak on their behalf, but you know it does have an impact on your single audit. Um, the money comes into your bank account and federally you have to transferred to the Maquam Bay within 10 days. And then with your warrants, I would just have to upload a warrant to show that you agreed to disbursement and that's how the reimbursements happen. Uh, um, you know, there's just a lot of little ins and out technicalities with all the paperwork and the, you know, your role and the staff's role, but I do the bulk of the administration. Um, your, your attorney's costs are covered for a small part of the attorney has to do um, so 
you know, the, there's just a lot of little ins and outs to it. But. And my next question would have been, you know, to Lynn, um, Lynn, what are your thoughts on possibly taking this on? Well, we did this similar to this um, with the Lake Commons and prior to my being here to Central School. Um, we, those were both VCDP. Um, my problem is we're going to have to do subrecipient monitoring um, of this grant because we are the person whose name is actually on the grant and we're passing it through. Um, I, you know, my question whether or not it triggers our single audit. Um, I'm fairly certain we're going to have a single audit this year and next year, but if we, for whatever reason, don't, and this triggers our single audit, who absorbs those costs? Um, those are the uh, main questions that I had. Um, I know that uh, Heidi had expressed a comment about, because um, there's like a, I think Liz, you had mentioned we, we need to do like a mortgage or something on the property. Um, I also don't know, is it going to be truly a grant or is there going to be a loan t tied to it? Just a grant? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and in terms of the mortgage, that is a standard requirement. Okay. And it, it's kind of pro forma. I mean, I the town actually just sponsored the planning grant. So um, that's a $60,000 grant. And for a planning grant, you'd have to do a you don't have to do a mortgage, but I'm working in Milton with a mobile home car co-op and the town didn't want to take a mortgage, but the community development said they had to, but they didn't record it. They just kind of did it to check the box. So okay. it's up to the town's village if you want to record it. Um, and then as far as the single audit, yes, the community development program allows, um, if you have, you know, your single audit that costs or $4,000, you can allocate the portion that this grant is responsible for you can take money out of this grant help they won't pay for the whole thing but it's an application okay um in terms of this sub recipient monitoring the way i work i've been doing this for 30 years i actually helped develop swanton school i worked with dick thompson and when he always sponsored the housing rehab loan fund at um, community development applications and we we worked well together on this we did the single lot but we did um all the monitoring together I um, I manage all the file keeping, and then for all the staff recipient monitoring, what happens is staff will do a, a monitoring visit with all of, with Lynn, I guess, with you, Heidi, me, and just um, look at all the files. I do all the reporting. You know, I happy to share whatever if you wanted a file share. You know, we could set that up. So um, I try and decrease the burden as much as possible on the village staff so that you know you're not you don't have to think i think for you that i guess what i'm saying and, and give you a heads up about everything okay um, or i'm always available to answer your questions and and i interact with the community development staff regularly for right now i've got about four or five municipalities around the state that i'm working with on this so another question that um i just thought of so I would assume at year end that I would also have to do um, the grant reporting like I do on my other two, at least until the grant the is closed department. out. Yeah, for the department treasury. Uh, the sub recipient. Report. No, the one with um, community development. Oh, yeah. Right with. Oh, do they require an annual report? So I yeah, grants? I've got like an annual report I have to fill out for both of those yeah. projects. So I would assume with this one until it is complete and closed out like those I still have to do because there's still loans outstanding but um, I would yeah. assume I would still have to do that also I yeah and that's something I have visibility into I think it's supposed to be municipal function and um, so yeah I certainly help you give you whatever information you need but I, I haven't actually put my eyes on one of those okay but when you're comfortable yeah, as long as Liz and I can work and Heidi can work close together, I don't have a problem. We've done these, I mean, I did the Blake Commons one and then I picked up the tail end um, of the other one because I was part of the closeout on that. But um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's doable on our side, I think. It's is, up to you guys, but. <laughs> is this similar to what we did with Heidi? 
with the uh, with the water and sewer line? No. Is this a, no? no. No. Okay. This is a step. That's a, that's a different agency, different project. Okay. Yeah, that goes up to EPA, this goes up to HUD. So this is just basically like what we did with Blake Commons, what, what they did. Yeah, yeah like Commons. it's like with Blake Commons, it's, that was a uh, community development block grant. Um, and I worked with Housing Vermont, Lake Champlain Housing, whatever they were called back then, and with the CBDG staff. Okay. And this time we'll just be working with Liz and yeah. Heidi. Yeah. Are you okay with it, Heidi? My, my cons the only concern, and I had shared this with Liz, was that um, if we were committed to this grant, would that preclude us from applying for projects going on here? for example the rehab of this building or anything else and it the answer was no that would not be the case applying for this would not prevent the village of Swanton from applying for funding for their own projects okay, okay. so and while there's a still open so it doesn't it doesn't limit what we can do because you've committed to this so that was one of the concerns that I was um, originally thinking about that's not an issue. And I am familiar with that program. I have worked with those grants before, so I, I can see collaborating with Liz is totally doable. Um, and I would just um, want to clarify that these are all reimbursement grants, so all the money has to be spent up front and then payments received. So it would be beholden on you to have all the money to make the project go forward, and then we would requisition funding to pay you. Yeah, thank you for that, bringing that up, Heidi. So what I do is arrange for construction financing for the project, and then the um, financing costs and fees and interests are included in various grants that are funding the project. So I have, the, my concerns were all addressed. So no issue with the corporation's needs and us advocating for the public's needs can be done. I'm sorry, I didn't catch I said, what you said, the air conditioner came Oh, out. yeah, I know, really <laughs> loud. Then. So there's no issue with us worrying about the corporation's needs and, and grants and things going that nature. And also as a trustee village advocating for worthy public or community um, advocates. Project. I'm uncertain who the corporation you're referring to is. Well, the village. The village. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, correct. So the village could still apply yeah. for funding to modify this building for ADA improvements or your um, restructuring of the space. So that is still, um, it does not take that off the table for the village. We're still able to do that. Are we looking for a motion to do that? this today or are we looking to to table yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. all right um so i make a motion to sponsor uh Maquam Bay, mrs koi abenaki um for the vcdp grant i will second the motion sounds very reasonable yeah so we have a first and a second for this grant support motion and do we have any further discussion about that any concern by anybody okay uh so we have a first and a second all in favor aye any aye. ways motion carried fantastic thank you so i, I would just like to just add you know the abnakis have had a lot of different approaches over the years. And some were only not so favorable, but I can honestly tell you that we've turned the corner. Oh, and it is unbelievable what we're doing now. Yeah. And you know, we have the right people in place and it's amazing how the respect that you can get back from people that see the change the change has just been unbelievable. I mean, we have people that are just coming in and 
and donating money to the food shelf just about every week. And I'm not talking a dollar or two. Oh, I know Some of them are yeah. very well given. And and it's one one person gave us money that never did before. He always did some other thing, another charitable fund, because of what had transpired. And now we now we seem to get some from a lot of people and trust me, it's going in real good use. I mean we serve right now about 700 people a month. It's unbelievable. And you know, and people are hurting out there. They really are. And, and you know, we're fortunate that we have benefactors that give us the amount of food that we need, you know, from Costco's and Hannaford's and, and everywhere that we, that we go, including, you know, Debbie gets, Debbie's written close to $250,000 in grants this year just to buy food and get food yeah. for that food pantry. And we are having, we just had a powwow. It was unbelievable. I've never had been to a, a powwow in a long time, but we had close to 800 people. You know, people come out for stuff that because of the corner that's been changed. And we want to make that building look fantastic. And you know, it's been run down for quite a few years. Unfortunately, we couldn't do the back, but we are doing the front and the main building. And that's our calling card. That's where everybody comes in. That's where our programs take over. We do basket weaving. They do everything. In there. And, and it's very well attended. So with that, far as from the Abenakis, thank you, because it'll be good, it'll be put to good use. Yeah. Well, thank you and everybody at the, at the council. It's just, I've watched it for the last little while and advocated for all the great programs and all the great events and the community events that have been put on by everybody over there, let alone the food shelf. And it's just uh, been absolutely fantastic. Yeah. And a powwow was a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's important to have the right people in the right places, and right now we have that. Yeah. And we even call on your old, your old, <laughs> your old over here. That's doing a fantastic job. So thank you for all you guys have done, and especially this tonight, which is our last piece that we need to get started. And we won't let you down. Mike, thank you. I mean, this is just an amazing thing for the community. It really is. I just want to say I'm a proud member of the of the band and you know I do what I can to support you guys Good. and we'll continue to do that. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Keep it up. <laughs> Also, up, Liz? Yep. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Number eight. Wayne Elliott. Aldridge and Elliott. We'll present bid analysis and recommendation for the award for wastewater treatment plant upgrade. Welcome back. Yeah, good evening. Uh, I've got Jameson with me, and uh, he's kind of the preparer of the bid analysis. So I'm actually going to have him walk through that with you, and uh, feel free to jump in with any questions, I guess, as we go through this. All right, good evening. Uh, Jameson Haddad. Um, I'm a construction project administrator with Alden Um I'm going to kind of run through the bit analysis that I prepared um, for the Swanton Village Wastewater Treatment Facility Upgrade, contract number one. Um, in the bit analysis, um, we have, there's several files compiled here. Um, a big portion of this is kind of vetting the contractor that has provided the low bit. Um, they checked all the boxes on the bid. Um, there were no bid informalities, so to speak. Um, and um, they are a very bondable company. Um, I guess I should start off. Kingsbury Companies was the low bidder. Um, they, are, they have great bonding capacity as well as financial capacity. Um, and they've clearly been able to finish and perform large projects like this across the region successfully. Um, in the bid tabulation, 
Um, it shows the, let's see if I can get to it here, the number of bidders that we had. There were quite a few that were interested in the project. Um, there were four, and they were all, uh, you know, it was, there was a, a bit of a spread, uh, but there were, you know, a couple, Kingsbury and Penta Corporation that were fairly close together, which generally means it's a good number, right? Um, looking at the total project costs, uh, we have it broken down with, there was a bid alternate to include uh, a fourth filter, um, which is sort of opted uh, to do. It makes sense to do that while you're in construction. It would obviously be more expensive to have that later if we complete the project without it now. Um, so I will run through just the estimated cost real quick, including that. Uh, the total bid or the bid price for the base bid was six million six hundred twenty-nine thousand seven hundred eighty-five dollars and ninety cents, um, adding the hundred ninety-two thousand dollars for the add alternate for the Ford filter and um, the small purchase, which the village has already purchased the centrifuge um, for uh, just under one hundred fifty-three thousand um, dollars. Excuse me. Uh, brings the construction subtotal to just under seven million, adding in a five percent contingency, which we like to carry for all projects for unknowns, especially on a renovation project where you get into something and it's just extras on a project that you can't foresee. Um, so that brings the total construction cost uh, to to have summarized in the first couple pages here. The total construction cost would be approximately six six million eight hundred twenty one thousand seven hundred eighty five and ninety cents. Um, the overall total project cost, including engineering fees and the small purchases, was eight million five hundred seven thousand dollars four hundred ninety sorry five hundred seven thousand four hundred ninety one dollars and five cents, and that includes the contract number one, um, the five percent contingency. Step one, two, and three engineering services, as well as small parts of the centrifuge and other administrative costs. Um, the original bond vote was passed for $8 million, um, which essentially covers how much would, if you were to have to borrow that much, it's covered. The um, available funding is through an engineering subsidy of $199,600, disadvantage subsidy of $750,000. There's a 13% pollution control grant of approximately $1.1 million. That number will change as the, it will be adjusted for the final price of the project once it's complete. Um, and an ACCD grant of $800,000, which brings the approximate um, Clean Water State Revolving Fund loan of $5.65 million for the village. So with all of the grants and whatnot, the final loan on the village would be $5.65 million to do the project. Uh, we reached out to a few of the uh, references that were listed and two of the most applicable ones. Um, one was a a large underground utilities upgrade for the VA hospital. Um, I believe that was in New Hampshire. I apologize, I don't remember where that was, but that was for $6.6 .6 million completed in 2021. And a uh, interrobe digester uh, for Vanguard Renewables that was completed in 2022. Total project cost of uh, a little under $13 million for that. Um, the general observations from the references were that they are fair to work with, they're responsive to the owners, engineer, and state, and their overall product quality was, was good. So there, there were no complaints on the finished product. Um, <clears throat> without going into too much detail, in the other portions of the document, uh, Alderson Elliott, uh, well, to summarize, sorry, the contractor appears to have acted adequate financial backing. They are very bondable. Um, the bid was acceptable, no informalities. Um, we've worked with Kingsbury before um, and are confident in their abilities to perform the work. 
So our recommendation is to award Kingsbury Companies LLC in the amount of six million eight hundred twenty-one thousand seven hundred eighty-five dollars and ninety cents. Uh, job progress shall stay on schedule. Recommending monthly job meetings with the owner, contractor, and resident representative. And the contractor's job superintendent to be consistent on the job site at all times while work is being performed, as well as a resident representative from Alter Chanel to be on site. Are there any questions? I don't have any. <laughs> was a lot to <laughs> yeah, I'm ready to make a motion to approve your suggestion of approving Kingsbury Company for the amount that I tried to write it down, but I couldn't write as fast as you were saying it. So, so uh, thank you for your work. So the motion stands. I'll second it. Second it. <laughs> Whatever. I was waiting to see if Adam wanted it. I, I, I was sort of waiting to. But this is one of my favorite little projects. I know you're uh, anxious to see the centrifuge go in and get the sludge the water and restart it here as soon as possible. I was going to ask if that had been in yet. Yes, it is in, mm -hmm. yep. And they're ready to start the first thing on it, so yep. Okay, so we have a first and a second motion to approve the uh, the winning bid for King's Ferry Construction, uh, recommended by your firm, Aldrich and Elliot, uh, or Elliot and Aldrich. Oh, yeah, Aldrich and Elliot. <laughs> That's perfect. Uh, for, I think it was 6821 and a few pennies. 785. <laughs> uh, any other questions or discussion? No, I have that motion here for. Um, so, Ryuji made the motion to approve the yep. morning yep. King Ferry construction the job yep. and to authorize the village manager to sign. Yes. Oh, I didn't know that part. Yeah. So oh, that's okay. part of my motion. <laughs> 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 yeah, and then we the motion. Put that in there. <laughs> and then Wayne, do you need a motion for the DBE analysis and recommendation? We don't. That's just as part just, of signing yeah, the necessary the documents. Yeah. So that amendment should just state that uh, you approve the Kingsbury for that set amount, authorize the village manager to sign all yes. necessary documents contained. Right. Yeah. I'll second that amendment. Thank you. So we have a first and a second for the amendment to the original amendment to approve everything we need to do <laughs> Thank you, to make this project go forward. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any nays? Thank you very much. Well, Thank you. Before yeah. you part ways, yes. what's, a, what's a tentative date to get that centrifuge installed? Because that's the first question I'm going to get to. We won't get that for you. Okay. Um, you. They were waiting. I think there's somebody from Kingsbury actually on <clears throat> remotely. Um, now we'll get this step. We'll get the letters. We'll get that into the state. Uh, they need to concur with the award, and yep. you know, then we can move forward with a contract award, notice to proceed, and get a get a finalized schedule out of them. So, yeah. Oh, I was going to ask if the if the centrifuge was here. It is. It is. Yeah. 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 It's, it's a village direct purchase. Oh, oh damn. Yeah. fantastic. Yeah. The reason <laughs> the reason for that is it wasn't included in Kingsbury's contract. Just the installation yeah, of the unit. That. Because if we had done it the traditional way, it would be in their package, and then we'd be looking at two and a half months for shop drawings, four or five months. So you can see we're already getting into early next year. So it's a way to expedite that. plug and play part. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us on the agenda tonight. Fantastic. Moving ahead. Moving ahead. Uh, number nine. Oh, it's, yes. Swan Village Police Department update with Chief Matthew Sullivan. And a few things going on. Yes, we've been busy. Uh, so you'll find there are two packets of information in front of you. I will start with the village. <clears throat> the uh, top 10 incident types were direct patrol 25, 18 traffic stops, 15 community outreach, 12 suspicious calls, 8 welfare checks, 7 agency assists, 7 crashes, 7 juvenile problems, 7 citizen assists, and 6 trespassing. There were 179 incidents in total, 18 traffic stops resulting in one ticket and 18 warnings. There were seven arrest charges representing seven individuals. And that is the summary for the village itself. And then looking at our total, 
um, for village, town, and outlying areas. Um, looking at those top 10 incident types, you have 79 directed patrols, 27 traffic stops, 26 suspicious, 26 community outreach, 19 agency assists, 13 motor vehicle complaints, 11 welfare checks. Uh, that is nine juvenile problems, eight disorderly conduct, and eight property watches. There were 321 incidents total, 27 traffic stops resulting in nine tickets, 23 warnings. Um, there were actually a couple of arrests associated with the traffic enforcement and uh, 12 arrest charges total representing 11 individuals and then 12.8 hours of additional services for the town for our contract with the town um, and then you'll find on the back side of this uh, our data um, regarding first south river street um, a packet of data from the speed trailer um, so looking and this was similar to the data that we received last year as far as the results it's not that bad uh, overall looking at it in the grand scheme of things from uh, may 30th until june 13th we measured 14,232 vehicles out of those 14,232 vehicles there were 6,704 vehicles above the 40 mile per hour speed limit but the majority of those vehicles, 6,128 of them, are 43% of the total vehicles measured, or within kind of the cushion of 10 miles per hour, so that 41 to 50 mile per hour speed limit. Um, you then had 508, which represented 3.6% of the total vehicles measured in the 11 to 20 mile per hour range above the speed limit. Um, and then it drops off rapidly from there. 61 to 70, 34 at 0.24 percent, 71 to 87 at 0.05 percent, and 81 to 90, 27 at 0.19 percent. And where the speed trailer was set up, it was right at the <clears throat> intersection of BB Road and South River Street. Just so you have some idea as to where these, quite ways out, then. these speeds were measured. Yeah, I mean we're kind of limited as to where we can place it, depending on. Sure. Um, you know the environment surrounding it um, so and then I broke it down into essentially between our contract hours because it was squarely within the town so you'll see that at the bottom there that there were 170 vehicles kind of in that uh, 11 mile per hour plus over the speed limit representing 1.19 percent of the total so again the grand scheme of things if you look at these percentages of total vehicles measured it's really not all that concerning. You do have these individual outliers with some pretty high speeds, which are concerning. Um, and then the pages after that, you will see um, more of a breakdown. And again, it's, it, it tends to be commuting times. So again, that early morning commuter hours and then uh, early evening uh, commuter hours so are the where the majority of the vehicles are. More so in the morning than the evening. Am I reading that correctly? To some degree, yeah, it looks like uh, I'm looking at this as far as total cars that were 1,068, it looked right. like at the 8 a.m. range. But I uh, mean, your speeders the, are like 650 ish. Is that, am I reading that? 645? Am I reading that correctly? I'm just, yes, yeah, okay. yep, 645 as far as speeders okay. go in that early morning versus the early evening, which is 500, 474, right. but you can see those comparisons there. Um, and then, and then you'll see a breakdown by time of day. Um, and it's giving you the speed ranges there. But, See, if you're looking at the if you're looking at the total data set of the fourteen thousand two hundred thirty-two vehicles, again that eighty-fifth percentile was forty-six miles per hour, which is right where we kind of want traffic to be. We don't we don't want excessive speeds. Right. It's not really all that bad as far as cell river goes. And again, you are going to get those anomalies, which is concerning, but you can get them in the village. And then following that, you see the speed trailer data from upon shore. Um, and that was measured from May 14th until May 30th. Uh, there were 18,489 total vehicles measured. 
uh, of the 18,000, 8,602 were above the speed limit of 40 miles per hour. Uh, and this the speed trailer was in the area of the drinking water um, facility, which is where these measurements were taken. Um, so this was also, I want to say, northbound traffic on the Quad Shore. Uh, and then, th again, taking the fact that there were 8,602 vehicles above the 40 mile per hour speed limit, 7,578 of those are 41% were within that 10 mile per hour cushion, or 10, within 10 miles per hour of the speed limit. Uh, and then getting above that, when you get to the 11 mile per hour plus range, you'll see 867 and 51 to 60 or 4.7%. 61 to 70 miles per hour, 82 were measured, or 0.44% of the total. 71 to 80, 13 were measured at 0.07%. 81 to 90, 58 were measured at 0.31%. And 91 to 102 at 0.01%, and 101 plus 2 at 0.01%. And again, being in the town, you'll see at the bottom of breakdown during contract hours. Uh, you know, that 11 plus mile per hour over the speed limit for the total of 464 vehicles representing 2.51% of the total vehicles measured. So again, in the grand scheme of things, when you're looking at the percentages, it's not that bad, but still there are some concerning anomalies as far as excessive speed goes in these areas. And I think we found that pretty much wherever we put the same train. You know, certainly through settlers and built as well. Yeah. And, well, and even <laughs> Grand Avenue right yeah. here, further up in the village. Yeah. So, so there is that. Um, well, if we want to move on to the next item. The next item on the agenda? Yes. Uh, you probably are going to be asked for an update about the Vermont State Police case from last night where we have some concerned citizens in our community. So uh, I guess I'm asking. <laughs> okay. Um, so I do not have an update other than the suspect individual that has still not been located. Um, it is a Vermont State Police case of a first degree aggravated domestic it occurred outside the village. Um, he just ended up being located in the village at a residence on Elm Street. Um, so it started in St. Robinson. Uh, it started It started in multiple different towns, so it was kind of a rolling, roaming uh, domestic assault. Uh, and so, uh, multiple different towns, again, outside of the village and the town of Swan, but ended up here in Vermont State Police, uh, ended up attempting to make contact, and my understanding is, is that that is when the subject fled. Uh, uh, fled. And so they realized that, after the fact, once they were able to get it, Uh, so I guess the number one issue is, is there anything we can do in the future to inform the areas of, or the people and residents that are being searched? It's difficult to do, again, because another agency was the lead agency, so uh, it's not something that we necessarily have control over. I mean, certainly. And, and, and this is the other thing is that I don't want people to think this is an anomaly. Um, so these things happen on a regular basis all throughout the state. Um, and it was just, I think, the level of police activity in the village itself, which is what caught the public's attention. But I can give you some other examples. So recently, obviously, we had the um, incident where the elderly male was pushed to the ground by a juvenile. That certainly caught the attention of the public. Um, the state's attorney, I know, uh, attempted, and I, I, don't, I don't know what the end result was, but attempted uh, to charge an attempted aggravated assault, an attempted assault robbery. I know in my conversation with the state's attorney is that would be, that's what he charged, but again, this is a family court proceeding, so none of that would be made public as far as where that lands. Um, and, but immediately after that, we had another aggravated domestic assault in the village at Marble Mill. So our officers were tied up dealing with that. It was a pretty bad aggravated domestic assault, very similar to the one that Vermont State Police were dealing with. Uh, and that was, I think the 
That was the same day same as day. the elderly male. It was immediately our officer went from that scene to the scene at Marble Mill and made an arrest and lodged the suspect in the case at Marble Mill. So again, these are not anomalies. These happen on a, on a regular basis. Um, there was, again, recently, within the last week, an aggravated assault of an adult on a juvenile uh, right here in the village, uh, which officers are dealing with. Um, and then also, I want to say it was last Thursday, we ended up responding to a disturbance with a gun in the village where a gun was pointed at one of our officers. So this is not, I mean, people need to understand it's not, and that's one of a lack of capacity, admittedly, that we're trying to get better at, especially now that we have an admin assistant working, we're trying to put more stuff out on social media um, to allow the public to know, and it's something that I'm certainly concerned with is being as transparent as possible um, for the public. We also don't want to compromise our ongoing investigations by releasing too much information too quickly, and it is a very delicate balance when we're working with other agencies, and if they're the primary agency on a certain case. Um, you know, I had to speak with Lieutenant Philip Heck today um, you know, in, in order to essentially make sure that I wasn't going to cause any problems when I created the press release regarding that incident, because uh, we don't hey, Bill? we don't want to hinder their investigation. Right. Bill, um, do we know? I'm, I apologize. I'm a little uh, green on this one. This started at Swanton Wreck, correct? This particular one from the other night. Did it start at Swanton Rick? Oh no, so that, that was a different one. I did not bring that one up, but uh, <laughs> that is another incident so that you're, you are correct that, that an officer made an observation of a dust cloud over Swanton Rick, went in there, um, a vehicle occupied by multiple juveniles sped past the officer um, as he was trying to initiate a traffic stop. The vehicle was blowing donuts in the parking lot. We have been checking the parking lot of Swan Direct because we've received complaints of similar activity. Um, the juveniles fled on Grant Avenue. My understanding is southbound. They passed the vehicle on the right and then attempted to negotiate a turn on the Bushy Street, failed to negotiate that turn, struck a street sign and a mailbox, destroying both of those things, and then came to arrest uh, a little further down Bushy Street um, where uh, our officers made contact with them. And again, it was a juvenile operator, so an arrest was made in that case. But again, that's referred to family court, so it's going to be a secret proceeding. Uh, and we can't release the names of juveniles. But it's it's been busy, um, quite a few incidents. And um, you know, these incidents are very labor intensive. So when we, you know, have a handful of officers on, it, and it really occupies a great majority of their time um, with solid casework. Bill, just. Just to touch base on the Swanton Rick one, do we know if Swanton Rick has cameras down there? Is that something, do you know if they're expecting or anticipating to put in? They are anticipating finding out how we are doing on security and surveillance and perhaps pig, uh, piggybacking on that project. Okay, thank you. So no cameras that we know of yet back here. Yeah. Okay, thank you. My big question is just, I don't, talking about just our department where you know if you have somebody that starts to spread a rumor or it's these armed and dangerous and on the loose I think you know how we have amber alert systems or we have public alert systems that can just start paying people on their cell phones if they're tied in for whatever um is do anything like that there, there is there's I know Burlington experimented with one years ago I think it kind of dropped off because they didn't have the participation they were looking for right with that, but it's it's labor intensive also. And then with this specific incident, I don't know how we did it with our own incidents there. Yeah. Um, so I'm, blank, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the name of the platform. Uh, it's escaping me right now. But uh, but again, it's this this would be something that I would have to rely on Vermont State Police to put that information out because it was their case. So again, I wouldn't want to be uh, sure. It, you know, again, intruding in essentially their investigation. We're certainly here to support. We work with them. They're one of our close partners, uh, certainly in rural policing. Um, they back us up. We help them out on incidents. Uh, so we work very closely with them. They're great partners for us. Yes. Um, not trying to say anything was done wrong. I think it just a lot of outcry for yeah, more I, information so that they can yeah, walk it, inside, advocate, or 
if like so at ten o'clock or so, I think the ESB released their their press release on the internet, right? So then they had the information of who to call and who to notify if you had any information. Yeah, that may be accurate as far as when their press release went out. Uh, and then once I was able to make contact with Lieutenant Phil Peck today, then we can call on so so um, on our social media page. Yeah, put it out there for folks to try to be on alert. But after that, it was just several hours of just what's going on. This week. Yeah, but again, so an incident like this, and I'm, I'm cautious to say that it's not, um, you know, there's no danger to the community, but you'll see that, right, with some of the incidents, even homicides, where we're able to determine that it was uh, people known to each other and there was a certain motive that was probably underlying uh, the act. In this case, it was domestic between known people. So even though this person is, is allegedly armed, I mean, a lot of people are armed in the state of Vermont. Right. I don't think that he necessarily poses a risk to the general public is, is my take on it. But again, people need to exercise due caution if they were to encounter somebody like this. Yeah. Um, so my understanding is there are currently multiple agencies working on trying to locate the individual and some with a lot better technology than what um, is available to local law enforcement. Um, so there's a lot of people involved in this case and, and my guess is this individual will be located shortly. Great. But for those following out there, he's still? Yes, he's, he's still loose. So large. <laughs> yes. But also if you see something, say something. You know, you, if you see him, call, call, us to call them, call state police, call somebody. You know, I think a lot of times people see something happening and then they get on to the community page and talk about it instead of reporting it to the police. And I think that's a misstep on behalf of our citizens that I would ask that they not do that anymore. I mean, you can go and discuss it, but please call local law enforcement. Yeah, and that's, that's a great point. And, and even a short time delay sometimes makes a huge difference yeah. uh, because you can cover a great deal of distance within a short period of time, usually. So, uh, so thank you for everything. And like I said, it was just throughout the whole day, I just kept getting people saying for more information. I'm like, as far as we know, this wasn't released. That's all we have to share at the moment. Uh, thank you, Matt. Yeah. Don't go anywhere. You were gonna. I know. We're moving on. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not over yet. Tanner. No, ten. 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 Okay. So. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, again, speaking about partnerships, so we um, we do partner uh, quite closely with Border Patrol. Um, so we are, because we're operating in a rural environment, um, we've been this pre-existed um, before uh, my tenure here. Um, we worked in, st in, or participated in the Stone Garden Detail Operation Stone Garden, as it's known. Um, so it's a federal grant awarded to each state, and it's administered through the Department of Public Safety. Uh, and it's a certain amount of money and then it's divided between participating agencies um, to assist Border Patrol and essentially um, bolster their manpower resource. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of the coverage as far as what's going on on the southern border and the northern border. Um, some, of the, it's, some of the statistics are interesting in that the last year in the Swanton sector, and again, keep in mind the Swanton sector is a very large geographic area. It's Eastern New York, mm -hmm. it's all of Vermont and all of mm -hmm. New Hampshire um, on the Canadian border. Uh, it, that there were 7,000 encounters last year that Border Patrol had with people crossing the border illegally. It is a crime to cross the border illegally and not present yourself at a point of entry, even if you're seeking asylum. Um, so far this year, my understanding is Border Patrol has already had 10,000 encounters. So the, the pace has picked up substantially. And now this may pale in comparison compared to the numbers on the southern border, but the interesting thing up here is my experience is <coughs> that this is sophisticated human smuggling operations. I mean, these people are not trying to get caught. If you've watched the news on the southern border, people are crossing in large groups 
but then they're pretty orderly, right? They're coming in contact with Border Patrol, they're being processed and then usually released into the interior of the United States. Here, they're coordinating with pickup vehicles, they're, they're being given specific routes to take um, through rough terrain, and they're entering the country illegally, and then they're trying to disappear into the interior of the United States undetected. Um, there was recently, I had contact within the Stone Garden detail with um, assisting the Richford AOR. Uh, they had three vehicles in a row crash through the border, and then they were pursuing them at a high rate of speed through the communities here in northern Vermont. Two of the vehicles disappeared into the interior of the United States. One of the vehicles was stopped with 11 people in it. Um, so a large mass of people, interestingly, from the United Kingdom, and um, I, I guess these people entered the country illegally because they would, they would not be granted the ability to enter the United States legally because most of them have criminal records mm -hmm. um, in their countries of origin. Um, in this case, uh, associated with a specific criminal organization in the UK, um, is my understanding. So, so it is interesting because I kind of asked the Border Patrol agent I engaged with them as to why would they do this when they could just apply. And he said, well, they wouldn't be let in due to their criminal history. Um, so my worry with something like that is then you have these individuals from a criminal organization in the UK who are entering the United States. And once they're in the United States, they'll probably get in touch with each other and then start operating in the same manner they were in the UK. Um, so it is fascinating right now what's going on. Uh, but there's a huge volume. Um, and although Border Patrol does a great job, for example, when, when we had the homicide on First Street, um, one of their agents responded initially as well as one of our officers were the first two people on scene. Yeah. So we back them up, they back us up. Again, we have uh, limited capacity, so they are a great asset in, in working with them. The Stone Garden detail, um, this specific ask was from the 2023 grant. Um, in that, and these grants go for three years. Um, and the funds need to be expended. So for example, I wanna say the 2021 grant, all those funds need to be spent by the end of September of this year um, because that grant period ends and anything that's not uh, spent is recaptured and goes back to the federal government. And these are things that we would not, again, have the ability to purchase as far as we just don't have the funds within our budget to, to purchase some of this equipment. So, uh, the equipment grant for the 2023 award was a total of $133,217. Again, something we would not be able to come up with on our own. Um, and it's for specific pieces of equipment. So because we already have the marine or boat asset, um, which we recently were able to repower through Stone Garden funds, um, so it has two new engines, so that asset will be... Um, you know, in proper working condition, my guess is for at least the next decade. Um, it's set up well uh, because we are one of the only agencies that also patrols the border on the lake uh, to assist Border Patrol there because there's a lot of drug trafficking that goes on on the lake um, as well and human trafficking. Um, so, again, this specific equipment ask was uh, $68,775 for the purchase and upfit of a heavy duty pickup truck to essentially tow the asset that we have and also use as a patrol vehicle for Stone Garden. So Stone Garden pre previously was very strict in the assets being used specifically and only for the Stone Garden detail. That has opened up to some degree. Um, the Commissioner of Public Safety was certainly concerned with making sure that how are these assets going to benefit the community and Vermonters in addition to the Stone Guard mission and supporting Border Patrol. And so, for example, we're a border community, so we already had one uh, cruiser purchased prior to my tenure here through Stone Garden funds. We use that cruiser on a regular basis on control. On patrol, because we are a border community, you know, we may encounter some of these things through the course of our regular patrol activity. And it has happened. We've encountered individuals, migrants, who have been in the village that we, we've received calls about um, and, and then had had to, had to deal with um, that situation. And in some cases, we're assisting them, trying to get them the transportation and, and that sort of thing, because they just don't have the means to do that themselves. Um, the second thing out of this equipment uh, award was an enclosed trailer. Um, so th that amount is $15,500 was what we were awarded. 
Uh, we have sourced a trailer that is available for that. And the third thing is a UTV um, that they were $29,599 to purchase. Uh, and there is an appropriate unit uh, here locally as well for that. Um, and so the idea with the UTV is to just be able to expand our support. Some of these areas are difficult to get to. You can't really operate a cruiser in those areas, so the UTV would help. And with um, the rail trail being a, uh, <coughs> you know, basically now um, increasingly used more and more, and I think you're going to see a lot more people using the rail trail. We can use it for search and rescue missions as well, be able to access some of these remote areas and be able to help individuals get out of those areas if need be. So all this equipment can be used for village? Dual purpose, dual purpose essentially, yes. Not just yes. But normally, again, with our budget, right, we wouldn't have the ability to right. buy a UTV. It's not something we would prioritize. Um, so that is the 2023 equipment ask. Um, also included in that, because if you do the math, right, you have on the agenda here, it's $113,874. That's specifically the equipment. It was $133,217 total. There's $2,000 included in that for boat maintenance, $16,000 included in that for boat fuel, um, and $1,343 included for boat oil um, in that equipment um, award. So it just, and just to, to touch on, it was broken down into 2023, two separate sections. The detail award itself was $111,888. And it gets, it, it's important for the community to realize that these aren't regular work hours for our officers, right? We're not, we're not using these funds to cover regular work hours. Our officers are assigned to a 40 hour work week. And if they choose to work outside those 40 hours, participating in the stone garden detail, they have the ability to do that. And then these funds cover their cost um, for that work. And it's a force multiplier for us because, quite frankly, they're engaging in traffic enforcement and that sort of thing, uh, you know, surrounding the community in Swanton itself, in Highgate, um, and in Alberg primarily is where we operate within the Swanton AOR itself. Um, but it is a force multiplier because then we have officers out there engaging in enforcement activity, looking for suspicious things. Um, and it's not a cost to the village, right? It's being covered by this detail money. So the 2023 award for OT was $87,988. Um, fringe benefits, $22,657. And then travel was $1,243. Um, the other thing I'd like to point out as far as the partnership with Border Patrol um, and the OFO officers at the points of entry, is that we've done some joint trainings for critical incidents. For example, if there was a critical incident at MVU, um, they participated in that. And again, they're a great force multiplier there. Their agents would be um, willing to uh, support us in, in any sort of critical incident there. Um, officers up at the point of entry said if there was a critical incident, they would, they would absolutely shut down the port and they could usually respond with at least 10 or more officers to that incident and be there within a matter of minutes. So that's a huge asset as well. So us. yeah, it's a huge community asset for mutual aid for public safety and well -being. It yeah. is, it is. And they've been great partners with us. Um, and just so you have some idea of where we're at, I mean, there's, I threw out a lot of numbers. Um, so currently we're spending the 2021 money uh, on detail funds and we're expecting to probably expend all of those funds either by the end of this month or the end of next month so pretty much right on schedule for having to spend those funds prior to October 1st of this year um, and then there were we haven't touched that 2022 award yet but I just gave you an overview of the 2023 award and then 10A. I need a motion for number 10. Oh, you want the motion first? Okay. And just to clarify, because you threw out a million numbers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 113,874 covers the truck and fit up, the trailer and the UTV. Correct. Okay. Perfect. I'll make that motion. Okay, you got it. I'll second it. Okay, we have a first and a second for the motion for the equipment purchase of the truck and the 
UTV and trailer and whatever. Mm -hmm. Enclosed trailer. Um, any further discussion? No. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 So, so any nay? Say, say. Do we need to amend it? No, I, no, I didn't know who said it. Okay. We're good. No. Um, so motion carried. I, or did I say the nay part? You did say that. I thought so. Okay, motion carried. Sorry. Thank you very much <laughs> for that. Uh, <clears throat> is there another motion coming up? 10A night vision goggles. Uh, uh, night vision. Right, so this was part of what happens is this was part of the 2021 grant. Um, so there were agencies, I want to say Franklin County Sheriff's, um, Chittenden Sheriff's, us, there, and there's multiple different agencies, Newport um, and a few other sheriff's agencies, uh, Orleans. East Orleans and, and maybe Essex uh, participate in the detail as well. So if you, if they're Basically, the Department of Public Safety doesn't want to give money back to the federal government once it's been awarded. So 2021, because we're coming up on that deadline, they had what they call a frag. So they had a pot of money that didn't look like it was going to get spent that was already allocated to a specific agency. And then they make that money available to other agencies. Part of our ask for, I want to say 20, was it 2020? Four was for the night vision, and or it may have been 2022. I would have to look, um, but they made some of those funds available to the tune of $62,559.75 to go toward five sets of night vision goggles. Again, it helps because, as everyone knows here, I mean, if you're out when the sun goes down and you are up in these rural areas, realistically, you can't see very far. Um, so night vision is a huge advantage for us um, in both search and rescue and if we're engaged in the stone garden detail um, because they are 24 hour shifts essentially they not 24 hours of time but essentially they have three shifts covering 24 hours that officers can participate in um, so you may be up on that on the border when it's uh, pitch black and not be able to see so again, this is something that we wouldn't necessarily have the funds to be able to purchase ourselves and be able to prioritize a purchase like this due to the cost associated with it and all the pieces of equipment that will really assist us in our regular patrol activity as well as the stone guard detail. I was just gonna ask, we can be able to use that equipment for certain individuals we need to might track down, running around. Yes, and it really- dark, wooded areas. Yes, <laughs> yeah, perfect. And they really make a huge difference. Which a huge advantage. Ones that BPI has in use. Are you getting the same like style or? Mm, these are these are not necessarily. I'm not sure what BP actually is using. These are um, something that's a, a very um, high end unit that, um, as well as. And, and what I did was I asked just so I'm very clear. I asked for eight sets um, because my experience has been if you can essentially assign a set to an officer to yeah, a full time officer. It will take care of it, right, and be accountable so we need for to that equipment. Um, so it, 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 uh, it essentially increases the longevity of those pieces of equipment. Um, so that was the original goal, and I think we'll still be able to purchase three more sets once the, uh, was it 20, it might have been the 2024 grant was the initial ask for this. Yeah. Um, so we're approving five sets tonight. If we're making a motion to approve five sets tonight. Correct, as and part of the 2021 frag. And then you're asking, you'll ask later for three more. Yes, assuming that we get that award. Okay. Now, and I, and I also like to point out that the state already has the money, DPS already has the money, um, I believe at least through 2023. They're in possession of those funds, so they're the ones administering the grant. The Fed awards the funds to the state, they then um, are the fiduciary for those funds. Um, and again, it's awarded for very specific pieces of equipment. Yeah. Okay. Some impressive pieces of equipment. Yeah. 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 Right, so uh, I make a motion to approve uh, the purchase of five sets of night vision uh, for sixty-two thousand five hundred sixty dollars. Fifty round it up. Yes, <laughs> that is. That would be rounded up. Twenty-five cents. Sixty-two thousand plus. <laughs> I'll second the motion. 
Okay, we have a first and a second to approve the motion for 62,000 plus for five yeah. sets of really impressive night vision goggles. Do we have uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, any nays? Motion carried. Thank you very much. For... That's the end of our grant. <laughs> <laughs> So we can move on to 11. Okay, so number 11. Discuss initiative for village of Swanton collecting and donating items to the two food shelves in Swanton. Okay, so this is um, my project. Um, I'd like to start an initiative for the village employees um, to donate shelf staple food, food goods or um, money. Um, 1 July through 15 July, and it will be the goods and I'll take the cash and turn it into goods. The goods um, will be divided between the two food pantries we have in town. So the um, Blessed Virgin, uh, Nativity Blessed Virgin Mary's food shelf and the um, Abenaki's food shelf. And uh, so it's a little bit of, I was hoping to have a little bit of a competition between um, all the departments and the winner um, would have a pizza lunch. <laughs> You'll, you'll get it. <laughs> and also like us in, in being included in sure. the competition. So so not the village in its entirety, but no, the, the village, village employees. The village employees, right. Okay. So the, the village itself, um, I've added a food donation component to the block party. So that will be um, on the twenty sixth of July. Anybody who wants to donate uh, a food item would do so to me at the chamber, um, and I would, again, divide those, whatever we get at the block party, divide it between the two food shelves. So, uh, just the, the summer months are really hard on our food shelves, and um, so I was trying to figure out ways to help them with what they need during this time, and it just seemed like a good, a good initiative to start. So, I would ask, Adam and Eugene to support my initiative, I will not vote on. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make the motion that we approve this project and maybe we can get a second. <laughs> and I'll second. Okay, we have a first and a second for this really fantastic idea for boosting the food shelf during the, the summer air time. And do we have any uh, further discussion on that? More yeah. questions. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, question. So if you're gonna break this down into departments, Todd, you know, like the water plant has two employees. Oh so Hillary they're one. Dibby. Yeah, yeah. Like water, wastewater, water. Together. Okay. Yeah. Well, no, so I just worried about the number of people in the park. Oh, do you, you want me to add them to you? More do you want me to add them to you guys? Well, so how about we when we work it out? Let's divvy them up so each department has the same number of employees. That sounds fair. So it's more fair. That sounds fair. Donate. Yes. It sounds so we like you clump some together. Sounds like you're gonna divvy it up and announce oh, it yeah, internally. Yeah, we'll do a stretch. All right. But I love nice spreadsheets. Yeah, you can't <laughs> just have. Two people in the water trying to compete with six feet in electric. You got it. It's true, right? True. Well, you, so let's do percentage it wise, yeah, it's right. figure out. I got it. Kind of, okay. Uh, that sounds fair. fair. This is on a <laughs> continuing basis, I assume. Well, we're, right now we're going to do one, one through fifteen July. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't want to hammer everybody over and over again. So I, I thought if we could do one through fifteen July, see how it goes, see how everybody feels. I and mean, maybe we could do it again during the holidays. How much time's that like next? Well, it's yeah. perfect in summer, as you were saying, because the holidays, they have a lot of, a lot of support that comes in for the holiday time of the year. But during the summer, you don't really it's, think so much of it. So right. It's perfect. But school's out and the kids, you know, are yeah. missing that extra, those meals that they get at sure. school, so they're hitting the pantries. And it, okay. So I just, I just thought it'd be a good idea. I have an interesting <laughs> comment. I would suggest that money be provided because sometimes the food shelves have certain needs and people don't bring the right thing. I've been in contact with both both mm. the heads of the food shelf, so I have a list um, and I'm, I'm keeping a running list, which I will 
um, put out to, I'll give to Diane and Diane yeah. can put out to the employees. That's so what I see a list of what Yeah, they what they want. Yeah, each food shop has given me a list, so okay. I will give that to Diane so she can give it to everybody in like a one email blast. Right? Wow, that's a fantastic idea. Awesome. Um, I'll find out. <laughs> Winners get to eat pizzas while lo the uh, losers get to watch. Ups get to watch. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a first and a second, a nice discussion. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Any nays? So motion carried to uh, put together this uh, food drive competition for the village uh, employees. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Oh, we're <laughs> 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 ah, okay. Number 12, our favorite topic in discussion lately, the B6 construction update. Yeah, so uh, we have a little bit of an update. Uh, tremendous amount of work behind the scenes by so many people uh, to get this thing kicked off. We actually had our first uh, all-hands meeting today with regional planning, uh, our engineer of record from Ruggiano, Engineering, our uh, three people from Dirt Tech, Heidi, myself, and the state of Vermont in the room. We are indeed on track to uh, begin this on uh, July 10th for a period of 20 days. It is incentivized as a reminder if they finish within 15 days, 360 hours from the time they put a shovel in the ground, uh, they get an enhanced uh, $10,000 reward for that. Uh, they have 20, 20 days, 480 hours from the time they put the shovel in, and they are heavily penalized for every hour thereafter. They're very confident that uh, barring any uh, emergencies that uh, they'll be able to meet that timeline. So that kickoff meeting was positive. I think everybody there felt comfortable with the plan that's in place in terms of from mobilization to the completion of the project. I think uh, we're hearing a lot of concern still from citizens. Uh, we're not doing this lightly. It's not the first project we've ever managed. We understand the concerns for traffic. We understand that there's a lot of traffic and a lot of delays. Uh, we have 11 variable message boards from Albert Four Corners to exit 17 to 9 located along the route. We have $20,000 worth of signage that will be, uh, will begin deploying effective July 1st. Message boards, message boards will be deployed and activated uh, that same week, July 1st, July 2nd, uh, you know, pending the construction for the morning. Uh, Heidi's in the room, she can confirm the number, but we have sent out notification to literally hundreds and hundreds of different outlets and locations. We'll make the final media push with uh, PTZ and CAX, some have already contacted us, but we'll do that the week before, otherwise it's lost. Uh, even Waze uh, the, the, has been updated. Uh, every traffic control mechanism in the state of Vermont has been activated again. Everybody in the room is comfortable. Uh, we attended the joint meeting. You heard loud and clear from the select board that there were some citizens that were concerned. Uh, that citizen didn't seem so concerned when I talked to him today. Uh, we will, however, next Tuesday, uh, Dean Ryan, our public works supervisor, will be on the passenger side of a 53-foot truck and trailer and will uh, cover the entire route. Uh, that same truck driver uh, says he does not see an issue as long as the other traffic, in particular car traffic, stops where they're supposed to be. Exactly. Stop cars. Right. Yeah. So the whole point of Dean doing that is to ensure that uh, if we have to move some signage, even temporarily, we'll do that, and we'll just uh, we'll just take control and, and make those adjustments on the fly. So I think that will be helpful. Uh, we have a traffic common plan in place. I think it's going to be naturally occurring. Uh, the chief and I have spoke. Uh, he knows that the number one priority for both shifts are that detour. And that's day and night, and we know we're going to have difficulties. Uh, we understand that it's a, it's a delay, it's a change. People hate this kind of stuff. Uh, we have no choice. We have to fix the bridge. We're doing everything that we can to make sure it's as seamless as possible. We encourage people to, uh, to continue to uh, out, reach out to us with any concerns. Uh, we're getting calls many times a day. We're answering many emails, but again, uh, it's two and a half weeks away. 
and it's 20 days. The alternative would have been 45 to 60 days of one-way traffic that would have been far more impactful all around. So that's that's really the update. Yes. Sorry, Adam. Absolutely. No, absolutely, 100% agree. Um, you know, I for me, I get it's an inconvenience, but if you go back to 1960s when they built this bridge, what did they do? They doing the same thing probably that we're doing now. So, granted, on a smaller scale, you didn't have as much traffic. However. You know, it's simply a 20 day inconvenience and we just need to be kind and deal with it. Um, so to be clear, so at least 10 days before the event begins, the signage will be up. So people who live in the immediate area will be able to be familiarized with whatever they're not already up to speed on, so to speak. I've seen it well advertised, including on digital signs up at the school and other digital signs around the community, let alone every organization that I know of in the area from every township that's been putting it on their community pages and we see it pop up constantly. But there's still going to be people. Right, so I'm working with Heidi. I'm going to go out later this week and put out for, uh, the posters. I'm going to give them to the businesses. We also discussed um, my going into Albert and giving a putting like with the Dollar General. She's a, a component of the Dollar General, at the bakery, the post office, the library, sure. uh, Maplefields, etc. So I'll, I'll do, excuse me, I'll do that. Um, try to hit the, the truck stops in St. Albans. Mm -hmm. um, so. But the traffic signs will be up. Yeah, but prior yeah, the eight, eight, eight to nine day. days before. Yeah. So they'll be able to read them, get familiar right. with it. Right. And, and we've also been in contact with CVP so that they know, um, not only for their officers, but for their um, for their truck traffic through cargo. Because um, I, I know at the Richford Park Port of Entry, nearly half of the officers live in New York. So it was you know vital to get that information out to them. And we do kind of anticipate that a lot of this traffic probably will completely circumvent. A lot of large trucks might go down Route 2, head south, or figure out different avenues versus trying to navigate back down through here. We hope so. We hope I so. Hope so. Sure. so we're not going to see. Well, as long as there's no problems with that bridge that's been that. stuck up <laughs> twice now. So that's uh, a concern. Yeah. It's fixed. Just, just remember when they replaced that bridge in the Hero in Grand Isle, all that truck traffic got filtered through Swan. Yep, right. We're just asking for 20 days. We're not asking for three years. Right, yeah. returns. Yeah. <laughs> returns. Yeah, no, I actually heard that the North Hero Bridge has been six hours. Right. Six. 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 All right. Uh, so, any Thank other you. information we need to talk about the D6 and the uh, okay, days so. are counting down now? I don't think so. Heidi, anything that we missed? No. Diane, no, you're dealing with it as well. Lynn, anything? Yeah, okay. people are looking forward to the walk party. Walk party, yeah. Yeah, that's so, a good thing. Do our best to uh, to get through it and have a little lemonade out of the lemon situation. Then the fire department will have lemonade in the park. Okay, perfect. <laughs> and maybe there'll be a lot of people. <laughs> E6 lemonade. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Okay, any further discussion about uh, about the B6? Okay, thank you. Uh, well, number 13, review and approve the sale of 2.6 acres of land in the town of Fairfield. Okay, so I'm going to give you a handout. We'll do background before we consider any motion. Uh, Diane, I'll give you this. You'll have it electronically also, but I'm wondering if perhaps we can at least get that in front of the camera because we don't have it electronically. Okay, so Fairfield Pond. This is a property that we have owned for a very long time since, uh, well, well, we've had a water line that's long dormant since 1908. Uh, this is a 2.6 acre parcel of land abutting Pond Road. There's uh, maps and property descriptors on page two and three. Located on White Camp Road, White Camps, White's Camp Road in the town of Fairfield. 
and we essentially bought it to have a control of the dam that is located there. And it's not a dam like you might imagine. It is a very small dam in height and it's approximately 20, 25 feet in length. The assessed value of this property is $160,700. We are proposing, and the town of Fairfield has accepted, uh, we're proposing to sell this parcel to the town of Fairfield for $1. This property uh, has little to no value to us. I would propose that it has zero value, but many, many deficiencies that impact us. We pay $2,480 annually in taxes. We found that based on ordinances in the town of Fairfield, as well as deeded rights for the property owners on White's Camp Road, we have an equal share of responsibility for maintenance of the road to include the repair, the expensive repair of a bridge and a massive culvert that runs under the road. Uh, that came to our attention last year when camp owners on the road reached out to us to ask uh, how much we're willing to contribute to that cost. Uh, we go up there regularly to clean out debris at the dam caused by uh, overflow, rain, and the beaver population. So that requires our public works teams on a regular basis, often weekly, to go up there and mitigate that so we would no longer be responsible for that. And then there's always the ongoing liability for that dam, uh, provided anything happened to that. So the second page shows a description. Uh, this is a non-buildable site. It is wetlands only. And the parcel description is on page three. So that is the background of why uh, I believe firmly that it is in the best interest of the village of Swanton to sell this property to the town of Fairfield for one dollar. I make a motion to authorize the village manager, William Sheets, to sign a quick quit claim deed between the Village of Swanton and the Town of Fairfield, conveying a certain parcel of land located in the Town of Fairfield. And I also move to authorize that the Village Trustees sign the Notice of Proposed Sale and publish as required by law. And I'll second. Okay, we have a first and we have a second to approve the sale of this public liability. <laughs> to the town of Fairfield for $1. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. Any nays? Uh, motion carries. And thank you very much for uh, finally, how long was this Eugene? Before me. Okay. <laughs> uh, for a very long time, we've been trying to deal with this. So oh, it's a very good thing. 1985, I think it went down. Yeah. So nice, nice, nice work. Nice work. Thank you. Okay. And I thought it was taken care of three more times. Obviously not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, number 14, village manager update. Bill? Okay, uh, let's start with the river crossing project uh, because it kicked off today. So they started work on Webster Terrace cleaning the, uh, the path from Canada Street down to the uh, Missisquoi River. They've started staging over on Foundry Street. Again, as a reminder, the first major portion of this project is the drilling. So as soon as that uh, subcontractor is on site, that work will begin. Uh, I met with them on site today. They did say that they're actually gonna try to keep the Foundry Street boat access open until the drillers are on site. So we're gonna buy a, a week or two uh, the signs are going to be placed tomorrow morning by Public Works. They'll be covered. So the minute that we have to uh, close it, we'll put an update online on our Facebook page and our website. Uh, but more importantly, you'll see signs as you, as you try to uh, enter Foundry Street. So that project is a, let's say, by the end of the year, but it's uh, supposed to be sooner than that, uh, will be completed and will be uh, good to go. Once they... Uh, once they have everything underground completed, of course, then they'll extend from Foundry Street down to the edge of the river and up Webster Terrace over to Canada Street and connect both. Uh, and then at some point, what is now the primary line on the bridge will become the redundant line and this new line will become the primary water line heading into the village. Nice. Bill, um, did they give a time frame as to, as to how long the drilling would take? 
It's in the scope of work. Uh, I don't have it in front of me. I'll have to look that portion up for you. I think uh, there is a date range depending on what they encounter when they're actually under in that bedrock. Okay. But I'll, I will follow up and, and get that to you. Yeah, I think it's just more curiosity. Yep. Somebody questions it, we've got the answer. Yes. Uh, the internship, Scott Mueller uh, Hydroelectric Summer Internship. So, interview process was great. The candidates interviewed were great. Uh, however, uh, it's going to go unfilled. The oh. primary selection backed out uh, mm -hmm. to take advantage of another opportunity. And in that interim, we believe that the runner up uh, also found another opportunity because he has yet to return repeated phone calls for the offer. Mm -hmm. So, We've been in touch with Paul Nolan, who is the uh, attorney who graciously donated the $2,500. And at this point, he wishes to have us keep that as a carryover. Uh, Lynn will make that notation in our financials and we'll utilize that next year. With that being said, if there are for some reason anybody out there that just graduated high school from any high school in the area that wants an internship this summer in the hydroelectric field to please reach out for Swanton Village because uh, we would love to have that discussion. So it's sad, but uh, the process and everything was good. It's just uh, in this job market, uh, he was uh, given an offer that he could not refuse. Uh, just an update quickly on the dry hydrant for the fire department. Uh, we talked about this very briefly, but the one uh, over on Route 7, Moving along exceptionally well, all permits are in place to proceed. Uh, we have a site visit on July 9th, and that's with the person who is going to ultimately approve or deny the $10,000 grant request. Uh, and we're pretty confident, Heidi, that it will be approved, and then we can move forward with that uh, for additional fire protection mm -hmm. south of the village, Johns Bridge area on Route 7. Is that all so that it's, it's gonna so cost? We think we can do it all for 10,000. There's an in-kind contribution oh, that's what I was thinking. with the village and the town that we believe we can meet that percentage for just with in-kind with the excavator and the personnel hours and other equipment okay. required. And I'm sorry, did you have a... I said that's at the land value. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Heidi, did I miss anything on that? Nope. Okay. Uh, we'll talk very briefly about this next one. Uh, former Hotel Rift site, 6 South River Street. Uh, it's just a reminder for anybody listening, uh, the RFPs, the requests for proposals for this property are due back on July 1st. Again, we're looking to partner with somebody early in the process uh, to work with the evaluation of corrective action alternatives for things that were found in the Brownfields mitigation report. Uh, and we would, the best approach is to do that collaboratively. So again, those are still open. Uh, the next trustees meeting, we will we'll, uh, hopefully have a lengthy discussion on all of those people who have submitted interest, of which, for the record, so far, are zero. Uh, but it doesn't mean they're not coming in. There's, a, there's plenty of time. Uh, wastewater we talked about, and uh, I think we hit it up. So the centrifuge, our ability to dewater our sludge, that will be the number one priority. So as soon as we get through all of the little nuances with the state of Vermont for what we approved tonight, uh, we have to upgrade the electrical. That'll be the very first project. We're hoping within 60 days, the centrifuge is up and running. But that's yeah. my hope, because the, uh, the engineer wouldn't, wouldn't commit to that earlier, so hopeful. Um, moving on to Merchant's Row. So everything at Merchant's Row that we promised has, uh, is now complete. So the handicap ramps there, we have the handicap parking spaces, we have the railings, uh, Everything that we said we would do, the additional lighting at 74 Merchants Row has been completed in anticipation of the construction in 2025 for, again, that's that $300,000 grant with a $75,000 match. And then piggyback to that, we'll have fall meetings at Merchants Row related to that and the implement, implementation as well as a discussion about what we're going to do on Church Street, $483,000 with a $128,000 match roughly off the top of my head. 473. Duh, close. I try. She's looking at me like I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Any questions reference Merchants Row? No, it looks nice. Okay. All right. People are excited about the ranch. 
This one's uh, pretty quick. I'll pass it around. I just want to make people aware in case you get calls. There was a uh, survey done at the request of the landowner located at 20 Foundry Street. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to pass it around and you're just going to see, you're going to go right there. So make sure you pass that along. Surveys was fine, but it expanded their lot from 0.25 to 0.35 acres. Uh, sadly for us, that additional land happened to include beyond our fenced in boundary and wastewater treatment. So there were several alternatives. The easiest one is for us to move the fence back onto what is rightfully our property. So Jason Starr is in charge of that and we are working to do that. And we will be able to do that in this part. I know the camera can't see. We're gonna come in just five feet here. We're gonna come in in between here and here, reconnect the fence in a straight line and we'll be all on our property without any real impact to anything so that we're trying to do. So right the border fence. This, right this right, the right there is our current fence that you can see is can that far on their me? property. And you can see the boundary line. You can see the boundary line. Yeah. I was holding up for the camera. Okay. She's going to have to go heavy zoom on that. Yeah, do you want to go near the shed? That? Okay. Yep. Little bitty triangle. Oh, I'm maxed out. I can just get it. A tenth of an acre or something like that? Do, do you want me to come closer? Probably no, it's probably it's less, less than that. Oh, well, that's not pleasant. Surveys happen. It's easiest yeah. to move it. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Okay. Easiest solution was that for long term. Sure. So I have informed the uh, property owner at 20 Foundry Street that we're going to work on that as quickly as possible. Uh, and Jason Starr is all over it. Uh, hydro. Uh, as you know, Unit 1 and Unit 2 are still down. However, the control ring for Unit 1 has arrived, ready to go. We install that. The good news is that we can't install it yet because of the massive amount of water that we're producing because you have to drain the penstock for eight hours and you don't want to lose eight hours of maximum generation at nearly eight megawatts to install a unit that's gonna produce up to one megawatt. So <laughs> once the water goes down, we can drain the pen stock, line up the wiki gates, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, and so then we, nice yes you do. And then we fire it back up, test it, and we hope that one works. And then we're probably two months away from unit two being uh, completely redone and back online. And that's a mag, right? A little more than a mag, unit one? Each one is a mag at a maximum, Together. almost always. Yeah. Together. Slightly to go okay. No, each. Each. Oh, each. Yeah. each. each. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Did okay. you like how I got in Wiki? I had a bet I could get in Wiki Gates in a conversation. <laughs> uh, just real quickly, just uh, some quick updates uh, programmatically. Uh, Public Works, they're maxed out. Uh, this, this is going to be a massive undertaking to do all the things that we're doing on the bridge in addition to all the other stuff. Uh, the, Prime, the Pine Street sidewalk is nearly done. Sidewalk's been poured. They got to do a little bit of minor work on the end. Nice. Uh, for Pickleball Nation that's watching right now, we will meet your, uh, your ask of providing two sheets of pressure-treated plywood for their practice area. And uh, we want to be friendly to Pickleball Nation because they're, they're friendly to us. So we're, uh, we're doing that. They're very happy. A lot of praise from that group in terms of everything that we're doing. Uh, I'll talk about what we're doing next steps electric when I get to that. We're also applying to be part of the state of Vermont's free leak detection program again this year. Uh, again, everything we're doing in every shop is geared toward an analysis, a critical analysis of our infrastructure to identify weak spots, prioritization, and all the things we want to do moving forward, essentially through grant funding and, and getting things done that uh, every community is dealing with. We have an aging infrastructure and the best approach is to identify and prioritize what we're trying to do and then seek massive amounts of grant funding to, to make that happen. Uh, moving over to, over to water really quickly. Uh, water, wastewater, maintenance all undertook and, and I do have photographs on my phone. Uh, Multi-day project to clean their clarifiers which must be cleaned every four to five years. Uh, it is like barnacles on the bottom of a boat and it is a, a mix of pressure washing and just uh, because you can't use any chemicals at all in that system and it's almost like scrubbing with a toothbrush this entire system. Side of the road or on the 
Come no, on the upper side of the road, so you know how you walk up yep. the stairs. Okay. There's a clarifier on the right, a clarifier on the left. Okay. So the clarifier on the right was, was done. Uh, you literally shovel all of those plastic beads out. Oh, okay. it's, a, it's a deep cleaning that takes about a week total. And then next year, the one on the other side's got to do. Uh, they've also completed their work, their rough draft on updated emergency action plans. And they're doing a tremendous amount of required maintenance and equipment upgrades of essentially things they have in stock and there's equipment replacement cycles because you've all been there and it looks like uh, a science lab with uh, all kinds of things going on. And then electric. Uh, electric's essentially uh, transitioning from their maintenance phase to their construction phase. Mm -hmm. So as you well know, we're getting two new businesses. Uh, they did the underground vault and they have energized uh, Green Mountain Bistro. So that is, uh, okay. that is ready to go. Uh, they're doing all kinds of things related to, they're ready to move once we have the security package in place. So real quick on that, remember they had a hesitancy to add enhanced lighting at Marble Mill, as well as the tennis courts until we had some type of ability to monitor and protect those. So Jason Starr took the lead on this. Uh, he went back out with some additional questions, but I think we're a week or two away let's say a, a meeting or two away from bringing to the trustees a proposal in, uh, in a series, right? We don't, wanna, we don't wanna do it all at once, but starting with Marble Mill, uh, a security and surveillance package using fiber. So uh, Electric Department and Al Mosier have reached out and they have a solution for fiber, which is gonna greatly enhance what we're gonna do. So you literally can have on your phone as well as recorded and backed up surveillance at hydro for dispatch uh, the police can look from their phone even before responding to, to these sites so we want to replicate that starting at marble mill and then that really truly is kind of a gem for us enhance all the lighting to include on the tennis courts and then expand out to our enterprises first followed by merchants row and and our, our parks so a lot went on uh, there they are starting electrics starting to install poles for the dcus for ami projects so ami is that automated metering and dcus are the units that are going to be pole melted in 12 different locations or 13 different locations so that the meters can communicate and get the data to us in real time and that project starts this year that project started five years ago. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> that project will finish next year. We're uh, living in a dream world if we believe that it's going to be done this year. But okay. I'm going to I'm going to be bold, and Lynn's going to ratify this. By the end of 2025, we will have AMI for water meters and electric meters for all of our customers. <laughs> and our GAS. Yes. So there we go. Yeah. Ratified. Done. Done. It has to happen now. It has to. Yes. And uh, that's all I have. That's a new. It is. Good. All right. Good and cool. A lot of stuff to think about. Mm. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other necessary business? I got a few things. Wonderful. Um, so, like I said earlier, uh, with the block party and the food donation portion um and i'll be handing out downtown bucks at the chamber of commerce um and i'm waiting for the banners from jc image they're supposed to be due in this week um and then i'm gonna uh, make a time with uh dean to go out and put those up he's gonna help me do that um so there's that and then um, at the last joint meeting, we talked about that Promote Swan Committee. So we will be meeting on the 28th here at the complex at um, 6 o'clock. And so far, the committee um, consists of my, myself, um, Earl and Nicole, as well as Oliver Manning from Planning, Darcy Benoit from SEP. We've invited Chief Gagne. Um, We've invited Ali Boren from the Arts Council, uh, Heather Lavoy from the Historical Society, and um, Jessica Hebris um, from the downtown business sector. So I think we're trying to make sure we have 
everybody covered and all the stakeholders having a representative um, as we meet to discuss this. Um, and then I just, a couple like events that I want to remind everybody of. Uh, we have Corn Fest on the 10th of August and there's a 5K run walk. It starts at one o'clock, so you can sign up at the Swanton Rec website. <coughs> and we will have um, medals, placer medals, first, second, and third place for each category. So we have like a kids, cat, two kids categories, and then we have like three men, women categories. <coughs> um, and then the 40th Army Rock Band will be, um, Iron Sights will be in the Village Green Park on the 3rd of July at five o'clock. Um, the Rec's got a couple things happening at Marble Mill with tennis and the skateboarding. Um, and then we have a Wear Blue Run to Remember on July 13th at 9 in the Lower Rec Field. Uh, there'll be a Circle of Remembrance and then a Self-Paced 5K. Um, then, of course, the Block Party on the 26th, Adam's Car Show. And then National Night Out on the 6th of August from 5 to 8 in the Village Green Park. And also the uh, Citizens Band will be in on the 29th from 7 to 8. Thank you. July. And that's all we have. Do you have anything else, Adam? No, ma'am. Good job. I have something. Yes, ma'am. So um, VLCT come out with some amendments to take effect July 1st regarding open meeting laws. And uh, Half of them are already doing, but one of the things they now require is for our meetings to be recorded, either audio or video, and then to post that recording in a designated spot on our website. So I figured out how to do that, and I did post some uh, Northwest Access videos <clears throat> that I pulled off YouTube and linked them right to our website. So you'll see that now there is a spot for agenda, minutes, and recording. Oh, so okay. people can yeah. watch the video. Okay. Okay. So that was something new that we added. Did you see that, Eugene? No, but oh, I, was, I was just on there a couple yeah, days so, ago. <laughs> some like older meetings I found, you know, like posted the recordings too. Oh, good. Um, one of the other things was that we had to post an explanation there. of the procedures of submitting an open meeting law violation, how the public could do that, mm -hmm. and then a copy of the text for the title. Uh, so I also put that on the website and then it does also require the village manager and village president to have yearly training to be able to be. I've been kicked on. <laughs> so, uh, you and I yearly training. training yearly training. Yes. On this. It doesn't say what though. And I'm, Is it and open and I'm trying to find training? out. Yeah, it must be. Must be. Because when I took the open meeting law course, um, there were several village man managers and town yeah. managers that were on yeah. during that so to i get ahead of the one july i bet it's going to be that every year thanks just the open meeting yeah that's it was, a it was very, good. yeah yep. it, was, it was a really it was a good it was a good training so just okay. to let you know that those were the changes that were made and we are in compliance and i think that's the one you and i did together same we did that training the same day yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, july 1st <laughs> It takes effect July 1st, so your training would be in January of 2025, it says. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I did notice that they completely changed the LOT. What's that? Uh, the local option tax. Local option tax requirements. It doesn't have to go in front yeah. of the legislature anymore. Oh, really? Yeah. It's just, I think it sounds like it just needs to go to public vote. It, it's it. been approved for everybody. Yeah. So you can so just. So the towns can now decide. Just decide themselves. themselves. Yeah. And it wants more revenue. <laughs> and so if the towns decide to do that, then they don't need to. Designate, right? Well, I'm sure there's some I don't think the process has changed other than the legislative. Other than the, yeah. Yeah, the yeah. legislative part of it is gone. Right? That's good. I have one question for Lynn. I read that there were some new payroll deduction requirements. Yeah, Did you child find tax. that is it going to be significant for us? Or? No, I've got it in the budget right now. So um, it's, it's not uh, significant. It's the child. We label it as the child tax. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. the new payroll that they're hoping to fund for the new child care center, child care center. Well, that was there last year, right? So it goes into effect July one of this year. Okay. So we knew about it, you know, last year. Seven thousand dollars, I think. It'll be more than that this year. Okay. So, um, and we're, you can choose to take a small portion of it out of your employees, 
we chose when we did the budgets um, to oh, yeah. the village to pick up the whole cost. Yeah. And from the other offices that I've spoken with, uh, it sounds like most municipalities are going to bear the cost of it and not push it onto their employees. At this time. Discussion? Yes. All right, I move that we find that we enter into executive session for the trustees to receive confidential contract information for which the premature disclosure of it to the general public would clearly place the trustees and others at substantial disadvantage. I'll second your motion. Okay, we have a first and a second to move into executive discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, any nays? <laughs> motion carried. This ends. Uh, June 24th meeting. We want to keep